In this video, I'm going to get into some basic MATLAB programming. We're going to start with comments, arithmetic, and some very introductory functions. So I need to open up MATLAB, click in my search bar. Now it's obviously right there already, but I'm going to go ahead and type in MATLAB or even just start to type it in. I could just hit enter or I can click on this right here. I've been skipping how long it takes MATLAB to load in my videos, and I will probably do that in the future. I did not skip it here just now. It takes like three seconds. It's not a big deal, but I would really like to make these videos very streamlined, and I don't want to waste your time. All right, MATLAB's open. I need to navigate to the folder where the file is that I'm going to be demonstrating with. So I've already navigated away from the default folder, but if I want to get to the folder where my file is located, I need to click on this icon right here and then navigate as I would with any normal Windows folder system. Now, the particular folder I want happens to be in this part 01 intro folder. All of the code that I'm showing you, all of these files are available for free. Uh, it should be an easy, accessible download. It is linked in the description. You can download all those files through my Google Drive link. I encourage folks to do so and follow along through that. I'm going to double click on this folder. You won't see any of the contents of this folder when you're navigating to it through MATLAB. It's going to look empty, even though it's not empty. So I'll say select folder. And as you can see right here, there are actually a bunch of MATLAB files in that folder. MATLAB files end with the .m or .mlx extension. MLX is live script. I'm not going to be using live scripts. I find them to be unnecessary. So I'm just going to stick with the basic MATLAB scripts. A feature of those basic MATLAB scripts is that they are just text files. So here is that folder itself that I'm looking at in my current folder view window. And if I just right click on uh, part 002 here, which is what I'm going to start with, and open with Notepad, Notepad++ or regular Notepad, it will open up as a text document. Now I've got my settings set up so that I've got you know this matrix vision with the green text and the black background and all that. But I could just edit it right in here. It's very basic text documents. And that's great. That's what we like. So back to MATLAB, I double click on part 002, open it up. By the way, my number scheme, you might be like, what is this weird number scheme he's using? It goes, starts on part two, and then it goes three, six, eight, nine. What the heck is happening? I originally had a lot of different examples and I numbered them so that they would always be in order. Even if you dump all the MATLAB files into the same folder, they are going to be in alphabetical or numerical order. I found that to be handy. Now also, I left gaps between different numbers in case I should think of new content that I want to add between files I've already got. I don't want to have to rename and renumber all those files after the one I want to change if, you know, I need to insert a new one between two and three. That's why there are some gaps in the numeric naming here. All right, I'm going to click on this little narrow bar between my windows and drag to make my editor window larger. I have already increased my font size to make it easier to read. Uh, and it's maybe not quite wide enough, but that's okay. We're gonna do our best and go through it here. Here, we don't really have MATLAB code, we have comments. Now, if you've ever programmed in any programming language before, you've probably heard of comments. They are things that are going to be ignored by the computer. They are notes written by a human for a human. In MATLAB, the color coding indicates comments in green, and every comment is going to start with a percentage sign. Now, I'm going to try and get in the habit of putting a blank space after my percentage sign because I think it's easier to read, but it is not necessary. It is still a comment, even if it doesn't have those spaces there. Any information that you want to type out to see in your document that you don't want MATLAB to pay attention to, you don't want MATLAB to try and execute, you should put after a percentage sign. Scripts like this document that we're writing, basically documents that are organizing our code, are divided into sections using two percentage signs followed by a blank space. This is one of the cases in which a blank space is mandatory in MATLAB. So scrolling down slightly, you can see right here, I am separating what comes before line 17 to what comes after line 17 with two percentage signs and a blank space. And you can see this little horizontal blue line right here. It's very thin, but you can see it there. And you can see this blue bar on the left indicating that this is the current section that is selected. Sections are very nice for organization. I can run the code in one section without running the code in a different section. Very, very handy. So for example, I click anywhere in this section. I don't have to highlight anything. I just click anywhere in this section, hold control and press enter, and it will run 
these little arithmetic calculations and display the results over in the command window, as you can see right there. But I'm getting ahead of myself, scrolling back up. So use two percentage signs and a space to divide up your document into organized sections. Multi-line comments, so suppose you have a lot of text that you need to write out. You can start off with a percentage sign and an open curly bracket and close it off with a percentage sign and a closing curly bracket and write as much text as you need in between. This is just a shortcut. This is just a way of saving yourself time by not having to type a percentage sign every single line. So you can put as much as you want in between these symbols and it will all be commented out. It will all be ignored by MATLAB. Now, one thing that I think is a little finicky is if you actually try and put any other text on the same line as the percent opening curly bracket, or I believe the closing one as well, um, it no longer works. So this, as you can see by the color change, is no longer commented. Most other programming languages let you do that, but MATLAB apparently does not. So just something to be aware of if you choose to use multi-line comments. All right, finally, some arithmetic. So separated into another section. The capitalization does not matter. I just put that in as just all caps to indicate new topic here. So MATLAB, of course, does all your basic arithmetic, subtraction, division, multiplication. Uh, I didn't put addition in here, but it does addition, of course. Raising to a power, so this is three squared. And I can run this entire section by holding Control and pressing Enter. Control Enter is the hotkey, or the shortcut, for this button up top right here, Run Section. This button is actually different. This button will run your entire script from top to bottom, every single section. That is not usually what I want. This runs the entire thing, and the shortcut is F5 which is actually kind of interesting because that is the shortcut uh, in Octave as well to run the entire document. I will be talking more about Octave at the very end of this video. All of the code that I'm showing you except for one line works exactly as written in Octave as it does in MATLAB here. Scrolling on down. All right, this code right here, this arithmetic is the same as the arithmetic in the previous section, only I've inserted some spaces. The spaces don't make any difference. Hold Control and press Enter. And you can't even tell that I ran something different. It shows up exactly the same because it does the same operations. The blank spaces in this case don't matter. And you can really get crazy with it and just add as many blank spaces as you want. Um, and it will still do the exact same thing. Control enter again. You can't even tell that I just typed it in. It's the exact same results, same results up here. I wouldn't recommend it because it looks like garbage, but you could do that. All right, what's up with all these orange underlines? It kind of looks like I made a grammar mistake in Microsoft Word, right? It's got these little orange squiggles and highlighting on the operations here. It's got little orange tick marks right here. And if I hover over one of them, for example, it says line 25, add a semicolon after the statement to hide the output in a script. What's that mean? Well, it's suggesting that maybe I don't want to display the output of my calculations in the command window. So let's look at this section right here. So here I've got the orange squiggle. And it's going to suggest, hey, maybe put a semicolon at the end. And so if I do that, now it actually still has an orange squiggle because I didn't put the information, the result of the calculation. I didn't put it in a variable. I didn't use it in any way. So now it's warning me that the result might be unused. Now, if I do just say like x equals, now it is very happy with what I've done. No warnings at all, and everything's good. Now, if we just want to display the result of some arithmetic like this, we can just put it in the parentheses of a DISP or a display. Now, I'm going to be using DISP almost exclusively because it's shorter, it's easier to type. We do not get any warnings when doing this, even if we don't have the semicolon, even if we don't set something equal to it. In fact, it is incorrect to try and set equal x equals or anything equals to this. And if I run it, it gives me this error over here. Display all DISP or display, all it does, and there I just ran this section, it displays the results in the command window. Now, there's only two results because I'm only displaying these two. This one is suppressed by the semicolon, meaning no output in the command window, and the results are placed into a variable named x. Going back to the way it was before, if I run this, well, I get three 17s, and the first one is answer equals 17 because MATLAB provides sort of a default variable where if you don't put the results of your calculation inside of any variable using an equal sign, MATLAB will put it in a variable named ANS for you, but it will also give you the warning. 
I find the little orange tick marks a little obnoxious, so I'm going to do my best when possible to use DISP to display my output and avoid these little orange warnings scrolling down. In math class, multiplication is often assumed. Now, in other words, what I mean is, if you saw this in math class, you would know that you're going to multiply 2 by whatever's inside the parentheses. That is not how MATLAB works. You have to make sure and use the asterisk, which I might just call star because it's easier to say than asterisk, but you need to use the star to indicate multiplication. It is never assumed. Let's uh, uncomment this and comment this one out. Comments are also very useful, that percentage sign, for just like trying some code, getting rid of the code, trying some other code, stuff like that. All right, so if I try and run it, I get an error. Let's read this error here. All right, so in the file that I'm in, on line 44, oh, look how convenient that is. It tells me on what line there's a problem. Column 8, and a lot of times that's not very accurate, but it's trying to tell me like where, which symbol the error occurs on. Invalid expression. You should read your error messages and get a feel for the information that they provide. Sometimes they are very useful. Sometimes they're less useful. Um, this is maybe one of the less useful cases. It gives some information about if you're calling a function or you're indexing, there's probably a problem with your parentheses maybe, maybe they're mismatched, but that's actually all wrong. What's the problem is that we are missing the multiplication sign. So this error message is not the most helpful other than telling us that it's on line 44. So that's wrong. Uh, I'm gonna leave that in there, but just get rid of it. And this is correct. Let's display two times and then the rest of the calculation here. And I can run it with control enter and there's that 7.1111. Now I've been neglecting to mention the CLC here. CLC just means clear off your command window. I believe it's literally short for clear command. It clears off the command window to a blank slate. Look, I'll type it in here and hit enter. And my command window is now empty so that we can just see only the new stuff displayed. And I think that's usually very handy to do. Scrolling on down, order of operations. MATLAB does order of operations the same way that math class, the same way that mathematics states you should do it. That's not always enough because many of us actually learned it wrong in math class. Perhaps you've heard of PEMDAS, which is an abbreviation meaning parentheses come first when doing a calculation, followed by any exponents, followed by multiplication, then division, and then addition, and then subtraction. Except that's wrong. Multiplication does not come before division. There's really no difference between multiplication and division. In fact, you don't even need division. Why? Well, because I don't ever need to divide by four. If I have multiplication, I could just multiply by one quarter. Similarly, I don't really ever need subtraction. I don't need to subtract three. I could just add negative three. What do we do then about the multiplication versus division? Well, if we have multiplications and divisions, and there's not any parentheses or exponents indicating which comes first, well, we, we read left to right. We calculate left to right. So perhaps you've seen these so-called viral Facebook math problems where they say, oh, 95% of people get this wrong. Are you one of them? And then they trick you into like clicking on their you know, ad or whatever. And I Googled that and I came up, I found this one right here. Now, why do people get this wrong? Well, because PEMDAS seems to suggest that multiplication should come before division, but it doesn't. The division actually happens first. So this right here is equivalent to which of these which of the following? Well, it's actually equivalent to this one. Let's run it, control enter. All right, so this displayed nine. And then the next one displayed also nine, whereas this one displayed one. When in doubt, just use parentheses. Put your parentheses wherever they need to go to get the result that you're looking for. And so in this case, I put the parentheses around the six divided by two, even though I didn't have to, because that was implied that that would happen first. But now it's also visually there. And so a human reading it can be like, aha, we're going to divide six by two before we do anything else. If you're having trouble matching up your parentheses, note that you can see matching parentheses when you move your cursor. So if I click right here, you very briefly see an underline under this parentheses and this one. So if I click right there, you see there's a little underline with the matching parentheses. If I click here, this parend, I believe that's the singular of parentheses, We'll have a little black underline that'll briefly match up with this one. Click there, there's the two little underlines. That can be a very helpful technique to make sure your parentheses are matched as you want them to be. Scrolling on down. What happens when parentheses are mismatched? Well, here's an example. 
So I try and do this display right here. And these parentheses are matched. These parentheses are matched. But this one doesn't have a buddy. There's no closing parentheses right there. I try and run this section, control enter. And it's a big old error. It tells me where the error is located, line 61, right there. There we go. It says invalid expression. It's actually the same error as before, even though it's a different mistake, right? So sometimes MATLAB can't really tell what the exact problem is and communicate it clearly. Now, this is a really unfortunate error because it doesn't just break this section. Many errors do. Many errors will only occur in the section in which they are written. But now, if I try and scroll up and run you know, my arithmetic from before, so I clicked up here and do Control Enter, it's still got that error. Like the whole file is now broken. So that's really a problem. So you need to run your code and test it very, very regularly to avoid this sort of thing. Now you'll also notice there's a little red uh, circle with a exclamation mark, and there's a little red tick mark right here. Now if you click on that tick mark, it will take you directly to the line where that error is occurred. So that's really useful. And that's true of the orange ones as well. Like if I click on the orange one, it takes me to that line of code for that warning. All right, so I go down here. Um, now I could just fix it by putting the closing parentheses, control enter, and now it runs the nine right there. There was no CLC in this section, so it did not clear off what was on the command window before. So that's why I like to regularly use those CLCs at the start of a section. All right, continuing on down, constants. So MATLAB provides a variety of built-in constants. Now for this section, I'm actually gonna do some formatting. I'm gonna talk more about formatting in the next video or in an, uh, one of the upcoming videos. So don't really worry about this. This first one is just saying like how many decimal places I wanna see. And the second one is saying that I want the command window single spaced instead of double spaced. All right, but let's run this section, control enter. So I cleared off the command window and then I'm gonna display some new stuff. I'm going to display pi, just pi right here. It's built into MATLAB. Whenever you say pi, it's going to do 3.1415, etc., etc., etc. It is more accurate than it appears here. The formatting is only displaying four digits. But just you know, briefly, for example, if instead I do long g, Control Enter, now we see, aha, it's actually got many more digits of pi. Now it is limited. It can't precisely perfectly represent pi because pi's decimal places go on forever. So it does its best and uh, represents many of those digits, but not all of them. Now, I'm just gonna go back to short g because I think it's easier to read. All right, there we go. So there's pi. Um, this right here, this like display and then parentheses and then apostrophes around a single blank space, like literally just hitting the space bar in between, displays a blank line. So this actually gives me double spacing even though I said I wanted single spaced right here. So it's kind of funny. This is a little bit of a mistake I made uh, to say I wanted format compact and then I literally just inserted the blank spaces uh, instead. So if I get rid of those very briefly here and rerun it, now it's single spaced. So it's kind of funny because I put in a lot more work to make it double spaced because I changed the formatting to single spaced. Anyway, the imaginary number. So one I is used for the imaginary number. When I display it out, it appears as the complex number zero plus one I. Zero is the real part, uh, one I is the imaginary part. I'm not exactly sure why you need to use one I. I mean, you can just use I right here, but it gives you a warning that says for improved robustness, try using one I instead. I don't know what that robustness means, but I just play by its rules and I try to use one I when I remember to do so. But if I just square I or one I, I get negative one because I represents the imaginary number. MATLAB has all kinds of complex number capabilities. We're not really gonna go into it in this video series until the very, very end. Scrolling on down, you can combine all of these constants uh, with other numbers, with all the operators that we've showed into a bigger arithmetic calculation. So here, four times pi plus seven times the imaginary number squared. That happens to be this value right here, and I display it out. What about E? So E is probably our third most famous mathematical constant. I'm gonna run this section, control enter. E is about 2.7 approximately. It also is transcendental, which means like pi, it's decimal goes on forever and doesn't repeat. And you might think 
Oh, it might just be E, or maybe 1E, if it's following the convention of the imaginary number. But no, it's actually EXP parentheses 1. And that's a little bit weird. And if we want E squared, we would do EXP parentheses 2. If we want E cubed, it would be EXP parentheses 3. And note, I'm actually putting comments right on the same line. If the percentage sign appears after some MATLAB code, only the text to the right of the percentage sign is commented out. So what's the deal with this? I believe that the reason the MATLAB designers chose to implement E in this manner is simply that in many, many physics and engineering applications and formula and calculations, you're raising E to a power. That's just a very common thing to do. So they made a function named EXP that does that. And you can use it to get just plain E by itself just by raising it to the first power by saying exp parentheses one. When I ran this section, I got ans equals this, and then ans equals this, and then ans equals this. And then lastly, I tried it with just a display. Now, when you're using a function, MATLAB's not gonna give that warning that like, oh, you need to suppress your output with a semicolon. You still could do so. So if I put in the semicolons and do control enter, it doesn't display those anymore at all. I just used control Z to undo very quickly there. A function is an action. A function is indicated by its name, followed by parentheses, and one or more items, or excuse me, zero or more items inside of those parentheses. So here, the action is raise e to the first power. Get the result of e to the first power. Get the result of e to the what power? Well, what's in the parentheses? Two get the result of e raised to the what power? Well, what's in the parentheses? Three. And there are many, many, many other functions. I just clicked over into the command window here and then cleared it. Square root. What's the square root of 144? Well, type that in, hit enter. It's 12. So this is saying perform a square root on what? On what's in the parentheses. You want a different square root? You put a different number in the parentheses. You want the absolute value of negative four? You put negative four in the parentheses of abs. Now, how do you know what the functions are? Well, you you know you look it up, you Google it, you uh, you know take a course, you watch these videos, whatever. Like I don't know all the MATLAB functions. There's way too many to know. Uh, I just know the ones that I'm experienced with, and so you know you'll gain familiarity as you practice. All right, before I go onward here, let me run this section one more time. ANS here is a variable created by MATLAB. When you don't put your information away, you don't put it into your own variable. Here I'm putting it into X. MATLAB is gonna provide a variable where your information will live. It's just a bucket with a name or a label. So ANS is the name, it's just short for answer, and it puts your data in that bucket. Now if I put in X equals EXP1 and then rerun this section, Control Enter, now you'll notice it doesn't say ANS here, it says X. So MATLAB is basically saying, oh, well, you provided a location to put this information, a variable, a bucket with a name. In this case, the name is X as opposed to ANS. So I don't need to. But then on this line, I did not provide a variable. I didn't say something equals. So MATLAB said, okay, well, I'm just gonna put it inside this variable right here and keep it for you for later in case you need it. The problem could arise that, well, then when you do another calculation and put it into that variable, what happens to the old one? Well, the old one is replaced. It's no longer available. We can do calculations on ANS. What is ANS minus 20? I added an extra space in there by accident, but it doesn't matter, and I hit enter. Well, it's this right here. Well, where'd that come from? Well, it's literally this number minus 20. Now we're seeing more decimal places, but that's just because more of there's more space without the 20 on the left. So the most recent value in that variable was this right here. When I subtracted 20 off of ANS, the original value was this, we subtracted 20, we got this new result, and we actually put that into ANS, or rather MATLAB put it in there for us. Now the new ANS, if I display it, is this new number right here. So this is truly a variable. It's just a variable that is sort of a convenience variable that MATLAB provides for you. Scrolling on down, there are many, many other functions, as I mentioned before. Functions take inputs and return outputs, usually. 
There could be zero inputs. There could be zero outputs. That does happen. Usually not. Usually there's some inputs and some outputs. One thing that's a little bit different with MATLAB compared to some other languages is that there can be more than one output to a function. If you walk into math class and you say, teacher, I can put one number into a function and get two numbers out, your teacher will say, that's not a function. And they'll be right. But we're in the world of programming, and functions in programming are a little bit different, and they're a little bit extra different in MATLAB, and we will see that there can be more than one output. We'll see that more in the future, though. Functions are written as a name or phrase, followed by parentheses. As we just saw before, and as we are seeing again now, abs is the name of the absolute value function. SQRT, or squirt, or square root, is the name of the square root function. Control enter to run this section, and we see absolute value printed out. Oh, by the way, also, you want to display some text, you use DISP, parentheses, inside those parentheses, single quotes or apostrophes rather, and then the text that you want to display between those apostrophes. You would not, this would be incorrect, to do it without the apostrophes. Notice both the color change and the little red warning underscore and the red warning right there. And if I try and run this, I get this error, invalid expression on line 99, right? So if you're trying to display text, you need the apostrophes on either side, and you'll also notice the color coding will be very different. I'm gonna rerun this section now, control enter. There's the results of my absolute values. There's my square roots down here. And I'm just, I'm not using the information in any way, although I could. I could say x equals this, y equals this, a equals this, whoops, b equals this, C equals this, run it. And now there's no ANS. None of those answer variables are needed because I've provided my own buckets, X bucket, Y bucket, ABC, my own variables to store this information. Continuing on down, functions fit in to standard arithmetic the same way everything else fits into the standard arithmetic. Let me widen the editor so you can see, All right? So here's just a arbitrary calculation that I made. The absolute value of 5 minus 7 divided by 2 plus the square root of 16 minus 3. I'm going to display out the result. Control enter. And it happens to be 2, the humble 2. Now we do have to be more careful than ever with our parentheses. Got to make sure because these parentheses now have to match up. These parentheses have to match up. We're taking the square root of 16, just 16, not the minus 3. That happens later. Taking the absolute value of 5 minus 7 and then dividing it by 2 in that order. Continuing on down. Never mind my little notes here. This is just notes for myself when I'm teaching in class. Skipping forward past that. Some trigonometric functions. Sine and cosine are naturally provided by MATLAB. And there's also provided sine in degrees. The default sine is in radians. The default cosine is in radians. And then we have sine d, or Cindy if you're feeling silly, cos d, those are in degrees. So what is the sine of 180 in degrees? Well, that's zero. What is the cosine of 90 in degrees? That is also zero. Astute mathematical students will say, oh, wait, wait a minute, something's going wrong here. Because sine of pi radians should be the same as sine of 180 degrees. Cosine of pi over 2 radians should be the same as cosine of 90 degrees, and yet they're not. What's going on here? Well, this right here and this are numbers in scientific notation. This is approximately 1.2 times 10 to the negative 16th power. This is approximately 6.1 times 10 to the negative 17th power. These numbers are very, very close to zero. They're not quite zero, but they're very, very close. The reason MATLAB is a little bit wrong is because it can't perfectly represent pi. We said earlier pi has an infinite number of non-repeating decimal digits. A computer is only finite. It cannot perfectly represent pi, so it's going to have rounding errors. And that's exactly what we're seeing here. That's something to be aware of. Scrolling on down. Speaking of rounding, here's some rounding functions. Suppose I want to round to a whole number. Actually. Let me put this back in with this round right here. Let me run this code. Control enter. If I want to round this to a whole number, I say round, parentheses, the number that I want to round. 
I can specify that I want to round to two decimal places by saying round parentheses the number I want to round comma the number of decimal places and there it's rounded to two decimal places. Ceiling is a special function that always rounds up. So even though this number is much closer to 7 than it is to 8, ceiling, or I mean seal is short for ceiling, rounds upward to 8. Similarly, even though this number is much closer to 8 than it is to 7, floor rounds down, and we get this 7 right here. This is the line of code that does not work in Octave, even though it works in MATLAB. And at the very end of the video, I will show you the alternative to this. Everything else that I've shown you and will show you works in Octave. Finally, very important, asking for help. Now, you know, you can always type everything into Google, but maybe you just want to stay in MATLAB and figure out what MATLAB has to say about the square root function. You can say doc space the function name and run it with control enter. A new window pops up with some help information that you can read about the square root function. Here's what it looks like to use it, there's a description, there's some examples, and so on. So very handy tool right here. And this is basically what you'll see if you Google it and go to the MathWorks website result, but it will be among the results you get. But it might still be worth Googling because there'll be other tutorials as well. And usually this result is fairly technical. It's not for beginners necessarily. Now the other thing you can do is help. So help and then the name of a function, such as abs, but we could also do cosine or whatever, or cos d or whatever. But let's just leave it as abs, help abs, control enter. Now this help information will appear in the command window. And so we can see, oh, sorry, it's not as long as I thought. It's just this right here. Now you may need to use the scroll bar to scroll to the right and see all of the information. But that's another thing you can do with any of the built-in MATLAB functions. Just doc or help and then the function name and run it. All right, just a couple more things before we wrap up this video. One is that you may notice this new file has appeared over here. It's the same name as the file I've opened, but instead of ending in .m, it ends in .asv. This is an autosave file. So as I'm making changes to this, those changes get automatically saved, regardless of whether I save them, into this autosave file. So if my computer should crash or something like that, uh, or the power goes out or whatever, it may be that if it updated recently enough, the changes that I made are saved in that file. Now, once I close MATLAB, that ASV file will go away. So just be aware of that, but also be aware you can't open it like in MATLAB. So if I like double click on it, it, it opens, but it's not like color coded. It's not really a MATLAB file. It is the contents of my MATLAB file, but I can't execute it the way I can execute mine. So don't worry about those. That's just what that is in case you were wondering. While I'm here, uh, the workspace on the left saves my variables. It shows me what variables are currently in memory and what their name is and what their value is. And we'll talk more about the workspace in the future. And before we quit this video, let's talk about Octave and how this line of code right here does not work in Octave. Everything else does. And there's some other subtle differences. So I'm going to open up Octave. So a few differences between Octave and MATLAB. The first thing is the sections. So when I use two percentage signs and a space, in MATLAB, it allows me to separate sections of code so I can run just one at a time and still have multiple different coherent pieces of code in the same document. That doesn't really work in Octave. So there is nothing separating this highlighted bit of code from this highlighted bit of code down here. The two percentage signs in a space don't do anything. Now what I can do in Octave is I can highlight a particular section of code that I want to run and then press F9, it does nothing. Uh, but if I go up to the Run tab right here and then go to Run Selection, you can see it says that the shortcut is F9, but for some reason that's periodically not working for me. So I'll click Run Selection, and there's my results right there. Let's move down to the part of the code that works differently in Octave, or doesn't work in Octave, compared to MATLAB. Scrolling on down, all right, this line right here. If I highlight this code and select Run Selection, I got an error, invalid call to round. Now, another thing that's unfortunate that I will note is that it tells me that the error occurs at line 105. That must be in a different document. I don't know what the deal is with that because it's not at my line 105. It's at my line 134 right here. Now, the fix is relatively easy. So 
Just because octave doesn't work with a round function that takes two inputs or two arguments doesn't mean we can't round to two decimal places. So what we can do instead is, I'll just uh, start by copying this right here, paste it. So what I can do is I can multiply by 100, which essentially shifts the decimal place two to the right, and then outside of the round function after that rounding is done, I can divide by 100 out here to shift the decimal place back two places to the left. So now I'm going to highlight this section and run it. And there's our results right there. And this number is rounded, or rather this number is rounded to two decimal places right there. And if I want to round to one decimal place, well, you know, multiply by 10 and then divide by 10 on the outside. And I'll run it again, run selection. And there's my results right there. And it works perfectly. All the other code that I showed you works uh, the same in Octave as it does in MATLAB. And that is true, I believe, for at least the next two videos. I think I forgot to mention it when I was recording the next two videos, but I did test out that code in Octave and it worked perfectly. And so I think uh, uh, a future video, maybe the third one after this one, there is something that doesn't quite work in Octave. And I, I do mention that. So anyway, this video has already run on a little bit longer than I wanted. So I will wrap up here. Bye, folks.